what I'm going to talk about today, it really spans a number of different areas. And I want to say from the get-go, I encourage questions. A lot of what I will talk about may be inside baseball for some people and maybe old hat for others to mix metaphors. So feel free to let me know if you have questions. I'm happy to stop. I'm happy to step back. I'm happy to delve into an area that you find particularly interesting. So I don't mind and I won't get off track. Feel free to, um, to let me know. The only question, Eric, is um, how will they let me know? Will they just say I've got a question? How does that work? Jane can fill that in. There's a chat button. Jane, go ahead and tell him. Yeah, I'm, Andrew, I'm happy to kind of moderate and interrupt him. Okay, that sounds know. great. Yeah, that sounds great. So don't hesitate to do it. That's fine with me. Um, so I'm going to talk about something that, uh, that Eric and I called the right to innovate. And let me just tell you philosophically a little bit about why I call it the right to innovate or why we call it the right to innovate, as opposed to intellectual property rights that can clamp down on your right to do anything <laughs> ever in the world. Um, it's just psychological, it's atmospherics, but I think that the way that Eric and I have both come to think, to feel about this is that, sure, there's rules, there's all kinds of rules, and there's all kinds of laws, and these laws constrain behavior in certain ways. But if you flip the perspective, it can be very useful. If you can flip the perspective and tell people what they are able to do, what they are at liberty to do, that gives them a better idea of how to act rather than give them a list of all the things they can't do. And it's been very refreshing for me to talk with Eric over the last 13 years about this because Eric's perspective is much more on the, I'm going to do it and who cares what other people think. Mm -hmm. My perspective as an attorney is, oh, no, 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 don't do that. Here are five <laughs> terrible things that could happen to you. We're talking about the same thing, but we're talking about it from very different starting points. Um, I've come around, I think, to Eric's view that it's much more useful to talk about what you can do and then carve out exceptions and explain things that you can't do and here's why. But generally speaking, your default is that you're able to do a tremendous amount of stuff. So the right to innovate. See if I can, oh, I see, I click, okay, there we go. So a metaphor that we came up with that I still really like, I don't know if Eric likes it, mm -hmm. is the idea of the innovation wetlands. And the idea behind it is that 50, 60 years ago, people thought that wetlands were terrible, stinky, unproductive places that you should pave over as soon as possible. But it turns out that wetlands themselves are tremendously important ecologically. And this is Earth Day, so we should acknowledge the fact that even noisome, smelly, malarial swamps actually provide all kinds of benefits and amenities and services. So when people started to realize that, we came up with a variety of protections for the wetlands because although they didn't have good PR, they needed to have protection and they needed not to be ignored and destroyed. Well, innovation is to a certain extent like this too. All kinds of people out there doing things, some of which are obviously beneficial, some of which are completely insane, some of which are totally safe in every way. Other things are, you know, kind of questionable and could potentially hurt people. But the point is that we want people to be doing stuff. We want people to be innovating. We want them to be thinking creatively. We don't want the default to be no innovation. Just do it the way that you've already, that you've always done it. So we think of innovation as the wetlands that often has bad press, but really needs to be protected despite the fact that it's not everybody's favorite thing right off the bat. So I'll just sort of summarize what I'm gonna talk about. And again, I don't mind interruptions and I'm happy to um, delve into anything that other folks in the class would like to talk about. So let's just start with a sort of a stipulation. I think it's, a, it's an empirical stipulation now that open user collaborative free innovation is socially valuable. This is something that delivers amenities to society. There are a whole array, a panoply of legal protections 
that actually shield the behavior of open user collaborative and free innovation. But there's also a lot of legal threats to the same behaviors. And a couple that we'll talk about is agencies that want to over-regulate and also excessive amounts of intellectual property. And notice, Eric, that I said excessive. I didn't say all intellectual property, <laughs> excessive amounts, because at least in my view, and I, I may diverge with Eric on this, I think that if it's done wisely and thoughtfully, I think that intellectual property has a role to play. Um, but I think that oftentimes it has become overarching and stifling to the types of innovation that um, are especially valuable and are not officially recognized. So there's a variety of different places where we can, we can sort of reach into and derive the rights that we have to do things. So one is the common law and the common law, all that is, is the custom and practice that people in places like the US, Canada, Britain, Australia, India, Hong Kong, have practiced for you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. Just the way things have been done and gradually society has adapted those things to sort of minimize the harm and maximize the benefits. So it's sort of, it's law that trickles up from below. There's also in the US, there's parts of the constitution such as what's called the Commerce Clause, which allow a certain freedom in the United States in particular to do things which is not always present in, in a lot of other countries. So the Commerce Clause, the default is that you can do stuff, you can sell stuff, you can make stuff, you can spread stuff. Privacy is another area that is, I think, increasingly important for innovation. The idea being, what I do is my business. And unless I'm harming you, butt out. I'm just gonna keep doing what I'm doing. And there are actually some legal protections that say that you need to stay out of my business even if I'm doing things that might harm myself. And then free speech. If I innovate and if I wanna tell people about my innovations, I can do it. I can do it by standing on the street corner. I can do it by emailing you. I can do it by tweeting. I can put up a blog. There are very, very few things that you can legally do to prevent me from telling others about my innovations. And one of the wonderful things about the free speech rights in the US and other common law countries is that the government has the burden of proving that it's okay for them to abridge speech. They have to show that it's okay for them to stifle what you're saying. So the default there is you can say whatever you want up to the point where you are specifically and immediately causing people harm. So you may not be able to scream fire in a movie theater if you have a good knowledge that that's going to cause people to be trampled and hurt. But up to that point, you can pretty much say anything you want. And you can say things that aren't true as well. So there's actually quite a bit of protection for innovation. Um, innovation has been around long before there was a proprietary set of rules like patents and copyrights and trade secrets, etc. And as I'm sure you've already learned from, from many of the speakers and from Professor Von Hippel, users routinely invent and modify to satisfy their own needs. And this is a powerful economic incentive that exists even without commercialization, people doing things to satisfy their own needs. Um, inventors often share their inventions. Uh, part of the reason they do this is that it actually takes time and effort and money to stay secret. You've got to erect barriers to prevent information from getting out. Is it John Perry Barlow that said information wants to be free? I, I always get the quotation source wrong, but information wants to be free. Um, intellectual property can be a hassle. I don't know if anybody in the class has ever tried to apply for a patent, but you've got to do a whole lot of work. You've got to hire a patent attorney. You've got to pay a bunch of fees. You've got to wait, wait, wait until the government decides whether your invention is good enough for a patent or not. And at the end of it, you've spent years and thousands of dollars. So as a default, not protecting can be a great option. And there's also network externalities too. The, the more people that use your innovation, sometimes the more valuable your innovation can be. So collaboration, working with other people, 
it can actually improve the process of innovation. And a lot of legal rules, especially intellectual property, try and move in the other direction. They, they actually try and prevent multiple people from using things at the same time. Um, there's a number of different technologies that have, um, that have enabled exactly these types of innovation. Photographs, phones, copiers, the internet, um, all the tools that are available now. I've got a 3D printer just over there that my kids use to make all kinds of crazy stuff. And, uh, you know, just printing in general. So, Eric, have you showed this to your class already? Have you showed the center pivot? Oh, I think you're muted, Eric. Sorry. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've shown it, but in a different context. So you can go ahead. Okay, so I'm just going to tell a very quick story about it. So you already know about this great means of irrigation and how it was thrown together from spare parts on a farm. But the point is, from with respect to what I'm going to talk about, is that this version of it here is the kind of version that will often attract intellectual property like patents. And the previous version, the version that was thrown together from tractor tires and duct tape and old hoses and things, that's the kind of version that often doesn't seek intellectual property protection. And ironically, the brilliance of this invention was the part that didn't seek protection. And the part that did seek protection, the part that's sort of ready-made for patents, is the part where there's very little intellectual input. There's just shiny, um, well-engineered parts, and that's often what gets the patent protection, not the original concept, not the rough and ready but workable innovation. And so you've got to be very careful when, when you engage in intellectual property analysis to make sure that the right people are getting the protection. I don't think the person that markets this, the shiny version, probably deserves intellectual property. I think if anybody does, it's the previous person with the thrown together parts. And yet this is usually who applies for the patents, big corporations who get their ideas from other people. All right, so I'm gonna start with one of Eric's favorite things, which is trepanning. Um, and I wanna start with a question. I'd like to open it to people to sort of share their opinions. Um, does the law, let you drill holes into your head to release the demons, to prevent the headaches, or just because you feel like putting a hole in your head? What do you think, Harry? Anybody have comments? I'd love to hear what people think. I'd love to hear it too. It's a I good jumping off point. Well, for the I think it looks horrible. I don't want to look at it, sorry. <laughs> this looks <laughs> okay. ugly, my friend, sorry. I know, but does he have the right to do it is the question. Yeah. You should, right? Uh, through I free speech, allow it. protections. <laughs> I ah, you wouldn't allow, allow it. it. That's interesting. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. 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 If I, I mean, was president, if... somehow I will create new roles. The roles is not. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. <laughs> Anybody else? We'd love to hear. Yeah. What do other people think? You should be able to do it under your free speech protections. So, you know, for free speech, you could certainly tell others about it. And, and there's probably other legal rights that allow you to do it as well. Um, one of the ways to think about it is that barring a specific rule, you can probably do this. Now, should you do it? I don't think so. Would I do it to myself? No, I would not. But can this person do it? And does the law have something to say? Now, the law, generally speaking, will let this person do this to their head. Um, and it's very difficult actually to come up with a law in the United States, we'll use the United States as the example, that can ahead of time prevent this person from doing this. The only real legal restriction that I can think of, well, there's, there's two actually, but one is if the law can deem this person mentally non-self-reliant. So, so if they are no longer able to make good decisions for themselves, and if they're a danger to themselves and others, then possibly through the medical system, you might be able to get them declared insane and committed to a mental institution. But that's a lot of work. And it's very unlikely for that to happen. And ahead of time, 
you can't do it. I mean, even if the person says, I'm going to drill a hole in my head ahead of time, I don't think you'd be able to get them committed. You'd have to really wait until they drilled the hole. By the way, Andrew, you couldn't drill it in your kid's head, could you? Well, so this is an interesting question. You as a parent have a very strong obligation to act in the best interests of your children. And that's enshrined in family law. So it would be very difficult for you to make the argument that drilling a hole in your child's head was in the best interest of your child. And <laughs> you might think that it is because you might believe that the child has demons in them, especially if they're 17 or 18 years old. Um, but it's gonna be very, very difficult to show that objectively that was the right thing to do and it was in their best interest. So, so I think what Eric's trying to point out is that there are actually heightened rules about what you can do to other people, especially young people, people that can't make decisions for themselves. So although I could probably drill a hole in my own head, I certainly can't drill a hole in Eric's head. And it would be difficult, even if Eric gave me permission, it would be difficult for me to be able to do that because we have rights over ourselves. We have autonomy in the law over ourselves, but that does not extend in general to other people. It's an exception in the law that gives you the right to do things to other people. And an example might be an end of life order. Um, if anybody has ever been involved in, in writing one of these instructions for if somebody's terminally ill and let's say they, they go into a coma, sometimes the family has the right to tell the doctor to unhook them from the equipment and let them die. But that's the exception to the rule. And there's a tremendous number of hoops that you have to jump through to get to the stage where there is an enforceable right for you to do something on behalf of somebody else. But yourself, pretty free and, pretty free and clear. Um, and you can tell other people all you want. Um, the restrictions are even lower on saying to people, yeah, I took a drill, I drilled it in, I feel so much better now. Um, <laughs> you could even tell people things that aren't true. You could say, I, I drilled into my head and now I am 10 times smarter than I was before. So you could even tell lies and the law protects that very robustly. So let's go to another one, um, not quite as extreme, but do you have the right not to use a helmet? What do folks think? Everyone? I think Prasad says you do not have the right. Is that right? Okay. What do other people think? I think you do have the right, but you get problems with your insurance if something happens. Ooh, that's a great answer. Yeah, that's a great answer. So um, it depends on the place. There are some places where you must wear a helmet, just like you must wear seat belts. There's other places where they don't enforce it, but it's really getting to the barrier of where your rights ought to be for a government to say that you must wear a helmet. Now, the insurance question is fascinating. Even in a place that allows you not to wear a helmet, your insurance company might have something very strong to say about that. So if you don't wear a helmet, and then you get injured, you may have to bear the cost yourself. So to that extent, the insurance company is like a law. And, and in fact, one thing I'd like you to think about as we talk about you know, how the law deals with innovation and deals with the rights to do things is that the law is only one piece of the puzzle. Um, a couple of other pieces to bear in mind would be, yeah, you could drill a hole in your head, but your neighbors might not wanna live near you anymore and you might become a social leper. Um, the insurance company might not wanna cover you anymore. And so it's not just the law that imposes restrictions, it's also how you're viewed by other people, and it's also how you're viewed by private agencies like, or private, private institutions like insurance, for example. Okay, um, how about this? What about bungee jumping? I just watched the beginning of GoldenEye, which has a wonderful bungee jumping scene where James Bond jumps off a Russian dam. And it's, it's a great scene, but the whole way down, you're thinking, oh no, he's gonna hurt himself. He's gonna smash into the concrete. But do you have a right to 
jump off a bridge attached to a bungee cord. What do folks think? Especially the first time, right? Before yeah, you yeah. really figured out this was a sport that was repeatable and safe. Yeah, I mean, it's literally a leap of faith. <laughs> As it were, yeah. So what do folks think? Do you have a right to do that or, or do you not have a right to do that? You've got a couple of chat marks down there. Is oh, that... I'm sorry, okay. Um, no, that's something Jane can handle, I guess. Yeah, Jane, Jane would you mind filtering yeah. those up for me? No, no problem. I didn't want to interrupt because you had moved on to bungee jumping. I just had Felipe and Michael who mentioned um, in certain states helmets are required and in others they aren't. Mm -hmm. For bicycles? Uh, for motorcycles, I think. Oh, um, yeah. That's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's totally true. And I, I think I sort of mentioned that um, it appears the government has the right to make you wear a helmet or, or a seatbelt but not every government chooses to do it. And the penalties are also different too. Some places that require you to do it, the penalties like a slap on the wrist. Other places, if you don't wear it, the penalty could be $500. So people take it quite seriously. So yeah, it's, uh, it differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. What are those? Dean has a, uh, has a follow-up question. I guess. Great, yeah, I what is it? Jumping. Dean, oh, uh, I, I wrote in his uh, bunny jumping. Obviously, it's not bunny jumping. It's uh, bungee jumping. Mm -hmm. Could this be a property rights issue? Because uh, the person here is uh, potentially infringing on uh, uh, public property uh, rights or um, air rights. So, Could this so, be an issue? Yeah, that's a, that's a fascinating question. So if you do it on somebody else's property, you could be trespassing. Yeah. Um, and if you, hard, if you smashed into something and broke it on their property, you might be responsible to pay for the damages. Um, so so that's, that's true. That's, and that's true of almost any action. Um, generally speaking, in places that allow private property, you have to obey the rules that the property owner has for you. And if a person has a bridge on their property and they say, like, so Eric's apartment, if he has, if he says, no, do not attach your jumbi, your, your bungee to my, you know, sliding door and jump out, you really have to listen to him. He has tremendous rights as a property owner. Um, most bungee jumping operations, I think, are licensed. They've, they've obtained the right to do it from a bridge and they've paid for that right. So in that case, there's no property issue, but you're right. Property issues are always, are always a problem. Um, there's also all kinds of regulation that might be able to prevent you from doing it. So for example, um, the, local, the local municipality might say, we think that it's inherently dangerous to jump off of our bridges with bungee cords. So if you do it, we're gonna fine you $1,000. You probably don't have a right to do it if they tell you you can't do it from their property. The question is, could you do it from your property? What if you have your own bridge? <laughs> and well, then I you could probably do it. it. I think what we're doing is we're diverting you too far. Uh, so, so we should probably get back to, to, to your main message, I think, here. Because Okay, I can so it's, a bungee, it's a bungee bridge too far? Okay. Yeah, it's a bungee bridge too far. Yeah. Okay, well, well, we'll move on. All right, so what rights do individuals have to innovate and diffuse their innovations to others? Okay, so in the U.S., privacy and free speech are both rooted in the Constitution. And what that means is that they are very, very deep and strong legal rights. So to the extent that what you're doing has to do with yourself, your own body, your own property, or is something that you do in private, something that you don't advertise to the world, and an example could be, for example, growing marijuana before it was legal inside your house. That, to a large extent, is something that is up to you and is protected by your constitutional right to privacy. So you could do crazy inventive things inside your own property, in your basement, in your garage. And there is a strong presumption that it's nobody's business what you're doing, including the government's. That's in the US. And we've already talked about the fact that if you wanna broadcast information about your innovations, you have even stronger rights. So you can do that out in the open. You can attach your name to it. You can broadcast it with a loudspeaker. 
you can hand out flyers, you can put a blog site up, you can tweet it. So broadcasting information, tremendous amount of liberty. Even if you're talking about things that could potentially cause problems for other people. So Andrew, um, yeah. I have a question actually. Sure. So yeah. um, I've seen, maybe this was a few years ago when folks were posting like 3D printed um, patterns for printing a gun. Um, for guns, yeah. How did, yeah. What, what's the thinking on that from a legal perspective? Yeah, um, so there's a couple of aspects to that. It's a great example. So the plan for the gun, as long as the plan for the gun is not copyrighted or patented, <laughs> it's probably absolutely fine for you to send out the digital file that codes the pattern for that gun. Um, it's probably also quite legal for you to explain in detail how to put the parts together and even how to insert a bullet and even how to point it and shoot it. That's all very, very strongly protected by your constitutional rights. By the way, when I say constitutional rights, the US gives you constitutional rights and then each state has their own rights. So you might have a double layer of rights that let you do this. So with respect to the information, which is embodied in the, in the gun, you're probably fine. Now, what you actually do with a completed gun, that moves you into a completely different realm of rights. So there might be gun control rights in the place that you live. And to the extent that that's compatible with the US Constitution, um, you'll be treated like anybody with a gun. There may be places where you're allowed to shoot the gun and places where you're not allowed to shoot the gun. And certainly if you harm somebody with the gun, you'll be treated identically to somebody else who bought a gun at the gun shop. So making the gun, spreading information about the gun or even teaching people how to use the gun, that's all highly protected. But actually using the gun, that gets you into a different set of rules where you're held to a much higher standard. Does that make sense? I've made no guns on my 3D printer. I will, <laughs> I will have you know. Um, uh, so, can I ask a question, uh, Torrance? Of course. Uh, uh, you know, thinking of guns, it kind of like, um, give me another question. Like, what if somebody comes up with like a criminal innovation, like how to murder someone, right? I'm just, it's also an innovation and they're sharing it on YouTube and stuff. Um, so you're saying that's allowed, but they're not telling you, know, you to like uh, murder someone, but they're teaching you how to do it. So there's a difference, right? Mm -hmm. So it's protected by the constitution, like your freedom, uh, you know, right to free speech that you can teach that or you can share your innovation about how to kill someone. So, how so do, like, you know, as, like financial, as, like financial fraud. How do I understand. So as, as distasteful as that is, yeah. you have tremendous rights to be able to tell people how to do that. So let me, let me sort of break it into two parts. So let's say, let's say you're a doctor, okay? But you're a really, really terrible doctor. And you know all of the arteries that if severed would cause death within 10 seconds. So you're just perversely you know, interested in telling the world about all the different places that a person could die. So you, you write a little blog about it. You say, you know, if you, if you cut them here or here or here or here or here, they're gonna die really, really quickly. You could even say, if you're trying to kill a person, these are the places that I would go for. <laughs> Oh yeah. Goodness. Okay. So, so let's, let's say you, you could blog about that as well. Now, I, I think that's morally reprehensible to do that, but could you explain all of the weak points in the body and the best places to sever if you wanted to kill somebody? I believe you could. That's the first part. The second part is, what if you say, all right, here are the ways that you can kill someone. And I really don't like Professor Von Hippel. And I advocate that you take a knife and you stab him right here. And then he'll die within 10 seconds. And of course, I'm not advocating this at all. No, but and I'm, I'm glad I'm teaching virtually now. You know, it's clearly a good idea. <laughs> if you did that, then in, 
in my mind, you've moved over to a different area of the law. And in that case, you might actually be violating the law. You, you might be counseling murder. You might be aiding, um, aiding and abetting um, the possibility of killing someone. So I think that that moves you over to a new area where the law does pay attention and the law could potentially prosecute you. Now, the, the question is, the information that you're providing, is it advocating that you do this to a particular person or a particular class of people? Or is it simply explaining that if you did this in general, the following thing would result? So, you know, take a, so if I drop a 10, a 10 ton rock on a hypothetical person, they will probably die. I can write about that. And here's all the ways that they will die. If I say I'd like to drop a 10 pound rock on my neighbor, John, because he really irritates me with the leaf blower, and I'm going to do it tomorrow, then I think the police will visit me and probably arrest me for planning, for planning a murder. So does that make sense? Does the distinction make sense? If it's hypothetical and general, you're, you're pretty much allowed to do it. Um, that's why you could have things like the anarchist cookbook. Is it, is it the anarchist cookbook or the anarchists? No, um, cookbook. It is yeah, cookbook. cookbook. Yeah, so you mean that freely circulates on the web and you really can't take it down in places like the US, despite the fact that there's all sorts of nasty tricks that they teach you in that book. But if you were to advocate it against a specific person, then you cross over into the world of, of being arrestable and, and charged with something. So um, I don't want to beat this point too long, but uh, Felipe has a, another question um, or another context um, to ask you about. So, for example, how to like whether cloning credit cards, for instance, is also kind of under the same sort of. That's a great question. So, so that I would divide it into two parts again, and I would say, if you instruct people how to clone a credit card, you're probably okay. Um, if you specifically counsel somebody to take a particular person's credit card and clone it and then use it to steal their money, you may be counseling a crime and, and that may be actionable against you. So if you, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not telling you how to do these things. <laughs> so don't take this as advice, but general information is okay. Impersonal information is okay. Once it becomes specific and personable, and especially once you start to advocate that people specifically do it, then you can be responsible for their actions to a certain extent. Does that make sense? Yep. That's uh, one of the classic examples is um, you could write something that says, I really don't like people who are not American. I just don't like them. And by the way, I'm Canadian. Um, <laughs> so I do like people who are not American, but Let's say I, I can write something that says, I don't like people who are not American. That's fine. Um, you could probably even say nasty things about people who aren't American. But if you say, every time you see somebody from Iceland, you should punch them in the head. Here's how to identify them and punch them in the head because people from Iceland are just terrible. That is probably, that, that goes over the line and that's probably actionable. You can't do that. So general is okay specific not okay okay this um this is sort of a nice illustration of the right to innovate and the right to communicate and eric you've showed this i'm sure right not, not yet no and i can see you looking at this saying how the hell did this end up in there well no i put it in because <laughs> I, I put it in because you, one, of, one of the slides that you sent me, I thought it'd be a good example. Ah, okay. Um, so what I want to do is I want to sort of link it to the law though. So I, I won't belabor what the graph says, but essentially as the costs of communication rise or lower and the costs of making rise or lower, you, you end up on different places on the graph. And there's places where producers are especially, um, let's say, uh, they're in a really good position. So when, when the costs of communication are high and the costs of production are high, that's a good place for producers. Am I, am I right, Eric? Mm -hmm. As the cost of information spread goes down, the cost of dissemination or communication goes down, 
this makes it easier and easier for individuals to, to do things, to disseminate information. And as the cost of production goes down, it also becomes possible for individuals to produce things. So my 3D printer is sort of a good example of this. I can get information from the internet for free about what to build, and then I can actually build it. So I'm in the lower left-hand side of the graph. Now, can anybody think of, of ways in which the law could influence where you end up on the graph? So what could the law do to push you down and to the left or push you up and to the right? Well, for example, if you are researching uh, you know, matters of uh, national security or uh, hacking up tools that are relevant to national security, you may not have the right to communicate it, which is something that would push you to the left, right, of, uh, of the graph. Right, because the effective cost of communication becomes quite high. So, and that's yeah. a great example, by the way. Um, there is some information which is considered to be an exception to free speech if it directly impinges on national security. And every country has a rule about this, including the US. So for example, if I come up with an improved thermonuclear um, device, I probably will not be able to put up that up on my blog post um, and leave it up there. I will immediately get a phone call or a visit from the FBI. It'll be taken down and I will be sued under national security laws. So, so that's great. So, you know, the information about a thermonuclear weapon, I could potentially publish that information except for the fact that the law specifically prohibits that. So, so that pushes you outwards on the cost of communication. What about the cost of production? And, and I'll give you a hint. I'm thinking of, um, of patents or copyrights here. It's really easy, for example, for me to produce something on my 3D printer. So what if I was to produce, um, let's say, a Monopoly piece, a piece from the game Monopoly. And let's, let's just assume that Monopoly has covered Monopoly with as much intellectual property as they can possibly cram in. My cost of production is really low, except what happens if there's copyrights and patents involved. Or let's say you had the uh, Coca-Cola uh, secret formula. You know, you could only make it at home. Um, okay, so that's- sorry to, inter sorry to interrupt, Andrew. I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page here. Um, Georgia asked a great question, which is what are the axes? Can you just remind us the axes again on this diagram that you've got up? Oh, sorry, one axis is the cost of production. And the other axis is the cost of communication. Eric can, can yeah, the correct vertical, me. The vertical one is the cost of communication. Yeah. Yeah, and the, and the horizontal one's the cost of, of um, production. And so if you go up and to the right, it's costly to communicate and it's costly to make. If you go down towards where the X and the Y axis converge, it's very, it's almost free. Well, it's, it's free to communicate and it's free to produce. And, and Thank over you time, the cost of communication has declined and the cost of production has declined in a lot of industries, which privileges user open and collaborative innovation um, to the extent that they can then compete with producers. So, so if I can just interject for a second. So what Andrew's saying, I think I am now, I am now taking my life in my hands and interpreting the late Andrew. Uh, but what Andrew's saying is, listen, it is getting cheaper to do all these things. We've been talking in this course about consumer innovation. And the point of this chart, and I'll get into it next time or so, the point of this chart is it's getting cheaper. So all these issues that he's raising used to be hypothetical. But now all of a sudden, yeah, what does somebody who owns a patent do if people are making one-off copies of his patented innovation, because they can nowadays. That's right, the right. Yeah, so, so I'm saying that, and I'm saying, I'm saying that if we allow intellectual property to be really strict, then we can artificially push the cost of things up again. Mm -hmm. And we don't, I mean, for, to sort of save the innovation wetlands, we do not want those legal costs 
to artificially raise us to the right and upwards when we've already been going down and to the left into this wonderful world of user collaborative free innovation. Right. So okay. what I, I guess what I'm saying is that the law is not just abstract, the law is also a cost. And if we allow that cost to, to, um, you know, to count against individuals, we can push them out into the terrible place they were before where they couldn't make things and they couldn't communicate things because it's too expensive. And that's back where the producers have enough resources and, and, and enough um, sort of, exp they have a better position to, to compete. Mm -hmm. so, so think of law not just as something abstract, but think of it as also something that's gonna add costs to both communication and production. All right, let's talk about some threats to the innovation wetlands or to user-free collaborative open innovation in general. Mm -hmm. so, so one is that in most countries, we have these things called agencies. And a great agency right now is the FDA. So during the COVID-19 crisis, the FDA has been criticized by a lot of people for not approving new tests, new antibody tests quickly enough so that people could actually use them and improve the quality of their lives. Same thing with treatments. So we, we get people claiming that particular drugs might be useful against COVID-19. Um, hydroxychloroquine is one example. Don't take it. I mean, make that decision yourself. I'm not saying that it works, but the claim is out there that hydroxychloroquine, which is also used for lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, will protect you against COVID-19. So the FDA has been criticized for not immediately letting people get a license to produce hydroxychloroquine for COVID-19. Um, on the other hand, if the FDA were to approve it without any testing at all, some people would criticize the FDA for putting people um, at risk because a lot of people trust the FDA. So one of the issues with agencies like the FDA is that they have a tremendous amount of what I call magisterial agency power. So they view their own mission as protecting people from themselves. They don't trust you to make your own decisions. They consider their own mission to be to do all of the hard work beforehand and then to hand you things that are absolutely safe and that will definitely help you. So that's great except when you want something now, or except when you've made a different decision than they have, you're willing to take the risk. Um, maybe you're on the verge of dying from COVID-19 and you're willing to take the risk that um, hydroxychloroquine might cure you. It might also hurt your liver, but you're willing to take that risk. And the FDA has been criticized for not allowing you to do that. So, Magisterial agency power, the idea is that we have these agencies that view their mission as precluding your right to choose. And as a consequence, a lot of innovations do not get approved or don't get approved for a long time. Um, this leads to a, a sort of a David versus Goliath situation where individuals may choose to do certain things, but the agencies stamp out that activity through a variety of powers that they have. Also, agencies and governments can produce unlimited volumes of rules. So I don't know if anybody's ever tried to get to the bottom of whether they're allowed to do something by going through the law, but you're going to have to look through books and books and books and books filled with different rules with exceptions and sub rules and sub sub rules and implementing regulations. So it's really difficult sometimes to even understand what the rules are. There's too many of them. They're difficult to understand. And sometimes they don't seem to be specific enough for you to make a decision. And then there's this kind of dread that some people feel that if they do something, they might be sued. And if you're ever sued by the government, for example, um, the government has infinite resources and you've got what's in your bank account. 
So do you really want to go up against phalanx versus phalanx of lawyers? This is the part of the talk Eric hates because he thinks <laughs> I'm going to scare everybody. But what I'm trying to point out is that the government has a large imbalance of power against individual innovators. And it's important for individual innovators to know that they can win and that they can prevail because if they don't know that, they might just give up because all of the cards are in the government's hands or the agency's hands. Was there a question, Jane? Yeah, if yeah. it's a good point for you to stop. There's actually quite a few. Um, Asim has a question and then Harry has a comment and then Felipe also has a comment as well. So maybe Great. we can go in that order. Um, Let's do it. Asim, if you want to take it away. Yeah, sure. So Andrew, uh, the question that I had will kind of goes back to the FDA comment you made the magisterial power, and I'm not from FDA, but I'm thinking that look at the opposite side of not having those, it will be total chaos as well, right? I mean, the implications are very severe. So having an innovation could be good, but it could also be lethal in that case. So having some governance. So I think the solution is probably kind of fast tracking the process as opposed to removing the, the governance agencies. Am I thinking the right way or is that what you were thinking too? <laughs> well, first of all, I'm not gonna tell you that you're thinking the right way because whatever way you're thinking, I think <laughs> is, the right, is the right way. But let me, let me make a comment on that and I'm gonna channel Professor Von Hippel here a little bit, um, I think. Eric can- I'm sure you will. He can disavow me if he wants. Yeah. So, so let's say that you're correct, that there would be chaos without the FDA. So what does chaos look like? Chaos looks like a lot of individuals making decisions for themselves. Now, maybe we don't trust the individuals to make good decisions. And I certainly know a lot of individuals that I wouldn't trust to make good decisions. But does this mean that everybody requires the FDA to make decisions for them? That's just, that's sort of an open question. Um, I think some people are probably quite good and quite trustworthy in making decisions for themselves and making decisions that particularly pertain to them and their circumstances, probably better than the FDA. On the other hand, um, you know, some people like a uh, seal of approval. They, they like to know that somebody's looked into these things. They like to know that there's been um, you know, tests, controlled tests that large numbers of people have been exposed and that there's a lot of data that they can rely on for, for trusting whether the drug will work for them or not. But the third thing I want to say is, imagine all of the lost opportunities as we wait for the FDA to approve the small number of drugs that they're capable of approving. Um, it's yes, true that there's that, potential... Andrew? Yeah, can I build on that? And yeah. it's absolutely right. You know, Asim, the point is that there are a million unmet needs out there and a million people trying to meet their own needs. And if the only thing that they're allowed to do is those few things which an administrative agency allows them to do, you're really screwed. You know, I, I mean, you know, from one perspective, maybe the FDA's perspective is chaos, but what it really is, is like the rest of life. There's mm -hmm. a great deal of complexity, a great number of different circumstances out there. The only way we address this stuff is by having freedom of action. You so, know? yes, yes, Yasim. So, Yasim, I can give you an example. And if we, if we had more time, we could talk about this, but... Um, Back in the 80s, when HIV started attacking a lot of people in the gay community, especially, a number of activists got together and started pressuring the FDA. And what they pressured the FDA for, it was the group was called ACT UP. What they pressured the FDA was to loosen the restrictions because what they said was, we are dying right now, right here and we can't wait for all of your controlled trials. And all we want is the right to get access to various drugs and try them out in ourselves because we are likely to die anyway, but we'd like to try something instead of just waiting for the FDA. And in the end, the FDA did bend 
to this movement. And they introduced um, within the FDA rules all kinds of exceptions, um, humanitarian exceptions for the usage of experimental drugs. So I, so I, I would echo what Eric is saying, which is for every drug that requires years and years of tests, there's hundreds of drugs that might work for certain things for certain people. And the question you really have to ask yourself, I think is, is it the right of a person to drill a hole into their head or not? If it's your right to drill a hole in your head, is it not also your right to take a drug? Maybe you're foolish for doing that. And maybe there are some people like little kids that we might wanna supervise more carefully, but shouldn't we allow people to make decisions on their own rather than tell them what they're allowed to make decisions about. Now, different people will come to different conclusions on this, but I do think that it's true that every time we constrain innovation in a system like the FDA, we're leaving a tremendous number of potential cures mm -hmm. on the table. And we'll never know because there's just not enough capacity to go through the formal process. And as we get into more and more complicated areas of innovation, like personalized medicine, where every single person reacts differently to different you know, percentages of drugs in different ways, the FDA will never be able to run all those tests. And so do we really force people not to treat themselves when potentially they might be able to do the experiments themselves and benefit? Asim, what is your reaction? So you the, you the one, weren't you the one who was against people drilling holes in their heads or was that somebody else? Well, logically, yes, I am against it, drilling holes in anyone's head. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Yassim, by the way, I'm against people drilling holes in their heads. I'm just not sure that I would prevent them from doing it. That's all. Yeah. I just feel I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you. It's just that I think when the times are, like the current times, I think it requires you to think differently. Yes, I think we should think differently and then all those constraints go away. But up until now, nobody questioned FDA. Everybody was okay with it. The seven years of drug innovation and everything, right? So I'm no. not disagreeing with you, Andrew. No, anyway. no. I mean, the point is that if you didn't have all this stuff going on in informal channels, you would not have the kind of care and treatment that you do around the world or the progress. Mm. If you have a particular disease, you see the doctor, say it's chronic, you see the doctor 15 minutes a month. What are you doing with the rest of it? How are you taking care of your grandmother, your grandfather? Mm. Right? The answer is you're doing stuff. You are earnestly concerned that it be the right thing for the grandmother or grandfather. You are observing the effects. You're being very careful, mm -hmm. but you're doing it. Right? Right. And you, you actually, life is so complicated, you cannot imagine it any other way. Imagine if there were just three or four approved ways to pick up your baby. Right? Nope, can't do it the other way. But wait, my kid, right? Imagine if you had to wait seven years and do a controlled trial before you could pick up your kid in the way that you could observe directly. Right. It's appropriate for your kid. So Can I just interject? Yeah, please. <laughs> it's Harry. Harry. It's Harry. For Harry. Sure. <laughs> Harry. Oh, my God, Harry. Yes. Before my head explodes. <laughs> um, Go ahead. I want that. <laughs> Andrew, I just want to, just want to clarify. Um, my impression for all of the years I've been associated with healthcare is the FDA has no jurisdiction over individuals. Yeah. Uh, the FDA has no jurisdiction over individual physicians prescribing. Yeah. Uh, and, and our point is, nor should they. I don't disagree with that. <laughs> no, that means, I, I agree with that. But, hmm. but the, you know, what I'm hearing is that the FDA is preventing people from doing stuff that they would like to do. And I would strongly disagree with that because I know of no circumstance that that is the case. The FDA controls interstate commerce of pharmaceuticals and foods and cosmetics based on statutory requirements. But once I get my hands on something or if I can make it on my own, 
the FDA has no jurisdiction over what I'm doing with it other than selling it, perhaps. Is that correct, Andrew? Yeah, so, so Harry, obviously I've trained you very well. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, I agree with what you're saying, Harry, but I'm, go I'm gonna give you a counter example um, where, where this could actually matter. I've, are you familiar, is, is anybody familiar with a case called the Abigail Alliance case? Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so essentially this is a terrible story, but this is an example of where the FDA, I think, can get in the way of people. So there was a, a girl named Abigail Burroughs and she had head and neck cancer. She's just a little girl and she wanted her, her parents wanted her to get access to a drug which was experimental at the time called Airbutix. You know Air, Airbutix, Harry? Um, anyway, it was only available experimentally to people in clinical trials at the time for colon cancer, not for head and neck cancer. And the drug, you know, was potentially available, but the company would not give the family any Airbutix to treat Abigail with. So they took it all the way up to an appeals court. So they took it through several levels. And the, the lower level court said that, that um, by the way, the FDA had the right to give her access to the drug. The company would not give her the drug unless the FDA approved it because the company didn't want to be in trouble with the FDA. So the FDA was really the gatekeeper in this case. So the first court said that there was a fundamental due process right for terminally ill patients to get access to experimentally non-approved drugs. So they thought they were going to be able to get the drug to this girl. And then it went to the appeals court and the appeals court said, no, there is no fundamental due process right. And that therefore it was up to the FDA whether to release the drug for this little girl, Abigail, who did not get the drug and then died. And we don't know whether Arbutix could have helped her. But in this case, the parents wanted to use Arbutix, the doctors wanted to use Arbutix, but the FDA would not release Arbutix from the company. And so they didn't get access. And, and the girl, again, I don't know whether Arbutix would have solved the problem, but there's a case where the gatekeeper function of the FDA prevented access to a drug to somebody who potentially could have used it. That's not my understanding of the FDA's role in those circumstances. So, but I'll defer to you because I'm not a lawyer and I don't play one on TV. But my <laughs> understanding is that the that the FDA can say yes or can simply defer to the company. And under most circumstances where it's, there's absolutely no basis for uh, that being done, th there's no likelihood of success with that. The FDA usually pull, uh, punches it back to the, to the supplier. So because I've been involved yeah. in right. dozens of those circumstances. Right. Can I draw, having, having created a mess, I'm sure it was my fault. <laughs> yes. Can I draw us back to the, uh, sure. the general issue sure. which, which, which beyond the FDA, which is if you have an institution, correct me, Andrew, if you have an agency, they can stop you both for reasons uh, intended and unintended. Yeah. Right? Are you going to mention unintended? Because what happens is just like the innovation wetlands, or sorry, the real wetlands, by neglect they can do it. Right. Remember that case, Andrew, in 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 the in the uh, EU, the European Union, where all of a sudden somebody decided it would be a great idea to require automobiles to only have standard parts in them right. by the manufacturer. Right. Yeah, that's totally destroying the hobby of a million people who like to hack their cars and improve yeah. them. And effectively destroying innovation in cars. Yes, but they didn't know that. They just thought, well, this sounds like a good idea. Let's do that. So, so they can have this huge ham-handed effect yeah. on a fragile wetlands. And that's your point, right? Well, th that's, yeah, that's, that's certainly a powerful point, And I will adopt that as my point, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, uh, yeah. Professor, could I, uh, could I mention something? Of course. Sure. Okay. Uh, I wanna, I'll make it very quick. Uh, but like, you know, we've been reading some very recent news about how the COVID came about, right? Like, I don't know, I don't know if it's true or not, but it's been 
in all the major news publications and it's being talked about by everybody in the world uh, where uh, you know some stuff was done in the lab to make some genomes from the HIV virus with some genomes from the bat virus and that created it. I don't know if it's true or not, but that's what we are reading in uh, respected publications. So in that sense, you know, that is innovation because they were trying to come up with a drug that would uh, possibly uh, kill the HIV virus and that would be beneficial to the whole world. But unfortunately, it got created into a monster that's now harming the whole world. So that's kind of also relating to free innovation, which could be detrimental, not just to yourself, which is okay because it's just yourself, but now this person contracted a worse virus, which was a combination of these two deadly ones, instead of curing something and then spread it, you know. Sure, let me, so let me address that. Uh, the first thing I'll say is, um, we, we actually, we, we were the organization that did the definitive sequencing of, of SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus. Um, it was not engineered in a laboratory. It is descended from a bat version of the virus. It's, we, we can't blame humans for this particular one. Um, okay. So there's there's no scientific evidence that it was injured. But, but let's just say that it was. Let's just stipulate that it was. So if, if it were, then I don't think either I or Professor Von Hippel would deny the fact that innovation has pluses and minuses. It has benefits and it has costs. And, and some innovations could potentially be terrible. But the question I think is, is do you throw the baby out for the bathwater? Are, are the benefits generally better than the costs? I believe that the benefits are better than the costs. And I think that it's hard to conceive of a system where we constrain all innovation just in case there's a bad result. In fact, what I would say is that that sort of goes back to the FDA. The FDA is erring on the side of preventing costs. And as a consequence, it's dispensing with benefits. Um, this is a decision that we have to make as a society. And I think every society makes this decision. Um, if, if I were you know, to vote, I would say I'd rather have more innovation because I believe that it generally leads to more benefits. Although of course there are some costs. Um, so whether or not the COVID thing was lab made or not, and I, I don't think that it was, there could be costs, of course. Just think of the drill in the head. There's a cost to that. But, but you would probably say, Andrew, that, uh, you know, the worst you can do with a drill in the head is kill yourself. But, yes. I mean, certain categories like, like pandemics, you wouldn't really supply every cool school kid with a uh, virus generating kit, would you? Uh, no, I would not. Um, I would not personally because I think that there's danger in that. And I think that there's danger in giving people, you know, fissionable <laughs> minerals where, that they can, you know, fiddle around with and, and irradiate themselves. Um, but in general, I think that people should be able to innovate. Yeah, in general, I agree. But, but probably in specific cases like the uh, build your own bomb thing, specific uh, constraints will be built into the law, right? Like, Well, yeah. And, and so actually, we're on exactly the right slide for that because you really have tremendous rights up until the point where your fist hits the other person's nose. And don't think about it literally, think about it uh, metaphorically. So um, could you set up a viral research laboratory in your back shed? Maybe, but the risks to your neighbors and the risks to your city are pretty high. So I think what the law is going to do is if it finds out about that, it's going to regulate that kind of behavior because the costs could potentially be really, really high. Are you allowed to set up a laboratory in your backyard that tries to extract DNA from a, from a strawberry? Yeah, you can do that. And, and I think 99% of the things that you could do in your back shed are really nobody's business and have no, no potential harms. But there are certain forms of behavior, inherently dangerous biotechnology, you know, fiddling with viruses, fiddling with communicable diseases, culturing you know, dangerous bacteria, um, working with nuclear weapons, um, all kinds of, of categories of behavior which are inherently dangerous, which I think that's exactly where the law comes in and regulates. And I think very few people would, would um, 
very few people would disagree with the law's role there. But I guess what I'm saying is that the law often starts there and then leaks into the beneficial side of innovation and pushes as far as it can go until it's stifling all sorts of other categories of innovation, which are not harmful and which are potentially quite beneficial. So we've, we've got to set the law the right place. And I've got a diagram at the end where I'll, I'll sort of show you where I think the, the line is. But um, as a society, we have to figure out where the, where the line goes. And I would push the line more towards the dangerous things and leave more freedom to innovate. Other people in a democratic society might push, the, push it the other way. And people that love the FDA, they might want the FDA to regulate absolutely everything, right, right down to you know, cotton swabs and nail clippers. Um, Andrew, you, uh, and Andrew, George has a really interesting point kind of sure, tying in yeah. what you've been saying to MIT. Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, I am pretty sure on this fact, so don't, qu don't quote me. Um, I think that all, MIT requires that all engineering undergrads take a class where at least one of the lectures is on engineering ethics. And uh, at least in my department, I know of a number of classes that have a lecture on engineering ethics. And in the class I work with the most, we talk about both intentional and unintentional harms that come with research and innovation. Um, so like in the case um, that Adit is talking about, you would imagine that the engineers or scientists are playing out in their heads what all the possible consequences are and weighing those risks and benefits. Um, I mean, I, I think that sounds fantastic. And, and I think it, you know, we don't want any more Tacoma Narrows Bridges disasters. So I, I, th I think really, it's wonderful that the engineers are thinking about ethics. And I think, you know, doctors do the same. And, and I think that considering ethics is a great idea. I would separate ethics from law, though. I would say that ethics is something that, that I strongly encourage everybody to engage in. Um, but I don't think ethics always corresponds to law. I think we, we try and enshrine ethics in law as much as we can, but sometimes law and ethics diverge from one another. There's all sorts of great examples. For example, um, you know, the, the, the racial laws before the 1960s. Um, I think the ethics and the law were totally on different sides there, whereas we, we tried to make them converge so that people wouldn't be treated with discrimination. Um, so I think it's wonderful that ethics plays a role in this. I would just say that law should mirror ethics perhaps, but it doesn't always do it. Does that answer the question? Yeah, George, you're right. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me mention a couple of quick things. So I've already mentioned the fists and noses idea that you can essentially do things that don't harm other people. You have strong rights there. Also, you can do things in your own property, your own house, your home viewed as a castle. Um, also, you can do small things and the law won't even pay attention. So this, this wonderful little Latin expression means the law doesn't pay attention. It doesn't cure tiny little evils. So to the extent that it doesn't really bother anybody, you can disobey the law, basically. Um, also, there's things where if nobody detects you, you're not going to get in trouble. And if there's no money involved, chances are society and the law are not going to pay attention as well. Um, one big thing in the US is this thing that I mentioned already called the Commerce Clause. And the idea of the Commerce Clause is that the federal government, the big daddy government, it can regulate commerce in the country. And it's been interpreted different ways by different courts, but essentially the, the tension or the debate has been, does the Commerce Clause give the federal government the right to regulate everybody's behavior at a micro level? Or does the Commerce Clause sort of allow general regulation, but leave people free to do most of what they wanna do? And where the rubber hits the road is whether there's money involved or not. So if you're doing things that are moneyless, that don't involve buying and selling, both directly and indirectly. So if you're not perturbing the market, generally speaking, the federal government and its law 
does not apply to you. But to the extent that you are participating in the market, the federal government has a much more powerful hook to regulate your behavior. Um, there's also... And by the, the way, rules. Andrew, wouldn't you say yeah. that that's a very important uh, implication for free innovation? Because consumer innovation, to the extent that it's given away and so on, as opposed to what Erdine was telling us the last couple of sessions about people starting up companies, you're not doing it for money. There's no money to track, right? Exactly, exactly. And, and I would say that that is one of the strongest arguments you can make that user open free um, and collaborative innovation in general escapes most regulation and escapes most legal constraints is that you're not really participating in the market in the way that the law thinks you should be if you're gonna be regulated. Mm -hmm. So, so absolutely, it's almost categorically free. And see, this is fantastic for us because it really provides the legal basis for an innovation wetlands. Right. And so if we can push back on things where by error, uh, regulatory agencies come in and, and squash things, if we can push back by saying, and this is Andrew's point, by saying, listen, there's huge value here. Stop messing with the wetlands. Then maybe we can have a, a similar effect as we did by pointing out the regular, and this was Andrew's idea, pointing out the, the, uh, uh, the value of the wetlands in the first place, where you had an analogous kind of a situation. Yeah, so, so I, I agree with what Eric's saying. What I would say is if you go back um, here, look down towards the bottom, here is a big difficulty. So what Eric just said, I totally agree with, but here's the caveat. Let's say you're innovating in your house, you're happily making life better for yourself, you're satisfying your own needs, maybe you'll even contribute to society by sharing the information. And suddenly you get a visit from five guys in suits and they say, we're from the government, and we want you to stop. You could say, you know what? You have no right to stop me from innovating. But would most people do that? No, I think most people would say, oh gosh, um, I'm really sorry for what I'm doing. Uh, I'm gonna stop right now because I don't want any trouble from you folks. Because remember, they have unlimited lawyers and they can crush you with bureaucracy and with filing suits, et cetera. So this is something that, that you and I have talked about before, Eric. We need an, uh, an electronic frontier foundation for innovation. We need somebody that you can call who will then take up cudgels and say, look, you can't, you can't interfere with this person's innovation. They have every right to do it. But what, what I worry about is the fear, the uncertainty, and the dread. And the worry that certain that, that most people probably would have if anybody even called them from the government and said, look, I know what you're doing and I want you to stop. Some people would be brave enough or have enough resources to fight back. But I think a lot of people would just take the path of least resistance and give up immediately and stop doing it. And I think a lot of innovation gets crushed that way because of fear. So Can I totally I agree, you? Eric. I just think that some people aren't willing to go to the, you know, go to the wall for that. Professor Torrance? Yes. Can I ask another question uh, in course. regard to the protection of the wetlands? Sure. I think I see another danger, not only the government, but also companies, because you were talking about the uh, commerce cl commercial clause. Yeah. So if we take the example of the irrigation system you've mentioned before, yeah. uh, this was a user innovation. And then there was a company uh, putting a patent on it. So an, an open innovation got patented. And yeah. so the user is not allowed to replicate it anymore, if I'm right. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think that that is a threat. Um, so and are there any possibilities for users to um, protect the innovations except for patents? I think in open source uh, software communities, there's the copyleft or I don't know, there's some new law uh, regulations that came up. Um, so, so 
okay, so great question. And yes, corporate interests can be a threat to innovation as well. Um, and aside from getting a patent yourself, I think that there are some innovations that you could use. So open sourcing stuff, whether it's software or whether it's hardware, I think this is something that's been underused. So it's, it's great in software. I think it's pretty standard in software. The courts have recognized the power of, um, of open source software. But what I think we also need is we need open source hardware. And there, there are some people working on that. They're working on um, mechanisms by which you could make the designs of your, your hardware known and, and publicized and published so that you couldn't be sued by a company um, and you could prevent them from patenting it. It's just been um, slow and difficult to get that going. And, and so I, I guess what I would say is I agree with you that it's not just government, it's also corporate interests that potentially have more resources and could try and stomp on your rights as an individual innovator. Um, what we need, again, is we need somebody who's willing to stick up for the little innovator and even the odds, a sort of a innovation equalizer. But, but that's a, it's a really good point. It's not just governments. Um, Eric, this reminds me so much of that, that um, anecdote you told me about the FDA and the regulations. That, um, so my, my, old, my old food drug law professor, um, who I just think was a wonderful guy, he, talk, he talked with Eric one day. Do you remember we talked about this, Peter, Peter Hutt? Oh, Peter, Jesus. Yeah, so, so basically this is the story. So um, Congress wanted to update the laws and the regulations having to do with the FDA. And the companies came in and they testified and they proposed new regulations and new laws. And when they were questioned about why they were so enthusiastic about regulations, they said, well, right now, and I, I'll probably get this wrong, Eric, but right now there's only 10 boxes worth of regulations. Yeah. And by the time we're finished, there'll be a box car full of regulations. That was horrible. It was and horrible. Nobody will ever be able to penetrate them again. Yeah. And so we'll be the only ones who can sell drugs. Yeah, this was this was Peter Hutt, as you say. And he was telling me, because I had testified in front of Congress and saying, yeah. no, no, and he was saying, You don't get it, do you, Eric? <laughs> don't get what? And he said, Well, what we're trying to do here is stomp out innovation. You've got it backwards. But um, it was horrible. But Sophie, to your point. You're absolutely right, in, in, and Andrew would agree, I'm sure. Uh, the neat thing is that copyright is cheap. And so you can copyright something like software and then apply this sort of uh, license like the GPL. Yeah. But patenting is costly. And so the question is, how do you come up with something similar? Right, Andrew? That's, yeah, that's, yeah I, I agree. Patenting that's what you're costly. Sophie, I think, yeah. 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 Okay, so I, I want to give you, um, it's one of my favorite examples. I want to give you an example. I'm sure there'll be a question about it, but um, <clears throat> this is an example of where the line is and where the courts have found the line to be what you can do and what you can't do. And I think this is going to shock you, but it's actually good for innovation. So there's a creepy old guy and he's a part-time DJ in LA. And he decides that he just wants to hang out with high school kids, but the high school kids will not invite him to their Friday night parties. So what does he do? Like any creepy old guy, he buys an ice cream truck and he drives it up. He finds out where these parties are going on in the Valley and he drives it up to people's houses. He rings the bell and the kids come streaming out. And instead of ice cream, he serves them this drug, a hallucinogenic drug called GHB. How do you make GHB? Well, you take liquid Drano and you boil it and you add some other ingredients. And hopefully <laughs> you end up with something that's not toxic. So he mixes up his custom batches of GHB and he hands it out in little Dixie cups at the side of his ice cream van and kids take it and they get high and they love it. And eventually you can imagine with Drano being one of the ingredients, some kid takes it, drinks it, it's a bad batch and he dies. Okay, so this guy gets arrested and the FDA 
takes it upon themselves to enforce because they think that this is their jurisdiction. This guy is handing out drugs and that he shouldn't be. He should be going through the normal channels. So they sue him. Goes all the way to an appeals court and the appeals court says, look, buddy, you're horrible. You're creepy. You're terrible. We think you're just despicable. But this drug that you're handing out is not officially regulated by the FDA yet. And you're giving it out for free. So you're outside of the Commerce Clause. So there's nothing we can do. And the guy gets off. So I know that most people's reaction to this is, wow, how could this creepy old killer get off? I'm totally with you on that part. But the part that I think is important is that when push comes to shove, even in cases this egregious, courts will sometimes come to the right result, which is you got to follow the law. And the law says that there needs to be commerce. If there's no commerce, then the federal government cannot be the, the regulator of the behavior. So I know this guy isn't the kind of innovator that we want to celebrate, but he's an innovator of sorts. And the fact that he gets off means that a million other innovators who are working on artificial hands for kids and cures for COVID-19 will also get off. So it's just an interesting and terrible case that shows that there are rights and the courts will recognize those rights when push comes to shove. Hey, um, so, right to, oh, sorry. Oh, so question, sure. If there's a um, question, I'd be happy to talk about it. Uh, just like something related to this, but let's say that you are a chef and you have an amazing restaurant and you've come up with a new dish. Sure. Okay? And you're selling it and you're saying, hey, you know, it's a new dish and we use like a shark fin or I don't know, something, something crazy in it. And, uh, you know, you're selling it now. So it is commerce. It's not non-commerce. It is commerce. Right. Yeah. And everybody has it, but a couple of people have it and they get some crazy allergy that nobody knew about. You know, maybe it's a shark fin, maybe some special breed of shark, who knows. And they die or they get really sick. Now it's an innovation in food and he sold it commercially and he didn't force anyone to have it. And he did say it's, you know, a certain breed of shark. What do you do then? So that's a very complicated legal question. Um, did the person in the restaurant have any idea ahead of time that anybody might be allergic? I think, you know, maybe a reasonable chef might think about allergies in general. I have peanut allergies. So, um, you know, this is something that resonates with me, but could they be held liable for something that nobody had ever been allergic bef to before? I don't know, that's a close case. That's a really close case. Now, if they'd put cyanide into the food to make it to give that extra little zing and, and they thought to themselves, you know, a little bit of cyanide tastes good, but we don't want to put so much in that it hurts people. Um, then I think it's inherently dangerous. And so the chef's going to be in big, big trouble there. What if the person, rather than getting allergic, what if they choked on a piece of food? That's again, a very close case. Um, I can't give you a really, I can't give you a general result for that. Um, those are very close cases and um, they're very fact specific. But, right, but Andrew, I, Andrew to, to come back to reframing uh, yeah. sort of what you're thinking about, could you, because you have like half an hour or less yep. left, can you just sort of like clarify where we are and, mm -hmm and uh, move us forward from there? Sure, sure. Um, so where we are is that there are certain types of behavior that fall within the right of the government to regulate. And there are huge, huge, vast fields of behavior that are beyond the right of the government to regulate. And tremendous innovation can happen in the latter. Mm -hmm. And in the former, you're kind of stuck. If, if you're participating in commerce, you, you have voluntarily put yourself into a regulatory regime, which is pretty strict. Um, but other than that, you're pretty free to innovate. You're not free of the fear, uncertainty, and dread, but you're pretty free to innovate um, 
as long as you're willing to take the chance of attracting attention. Um, so the default is that you should feel free to do stuff, but there are certain circumstances that you should avoid if you want to avoid being regulated. And one of them is participating in commerce, either directly or indirectly. Um, there are also, let me mention something that I've mentioned already, which is close to this Gaborda case we just talked about. After this case, the federal government listed GHB, GHB as a criminally regulated substance, like cocaine. After that, you could not distribute GHB, whether for commercial purposes or not. So there, there are some very specific circumstances where you can't do things, but those are usually pretty clear. So avoid those. Right. Like generally so, speaking, so the, you can innovate. Yeah, that's wonderful. And that's a major message for us that especially if you are innovating uh, in the free innovation zone that we're talking about here, you're almost entirely free and, and should, should it's, it's so funny. A lot of our students sort of, they look around and say, well, where's the regulator? Is somebody going to get me? Yeah. And the answer is shockingly enough, 99% of the time, no, nor should they. Nor so should you they. Are, That's right. you, yeah, you are free. The law is not going to stop you. And part of Andrews and my wish, in a way, an effort, is to make this more generally understood. That right. there's a huge amount of beneficial innovation out there. In fact, that's where most of the important innovation comes from. So for Pete's sake, A, don't get in the way of it if you are the government or something like that, and B, and equally important for you, our students, is realize you have this freedom and act accordingly if you want to. Yeah. So at the bottom of the slide here, I say much personal innovation is legally beyond government reach, and I think that's a good way to think about it. Mm -hmm. um, the default is that you should generally feel free to innovate. Mm -hmm. And you should certainly feel free to squawk as much as you want to as many people as you want about anything that you have discovered or invented, even if you're not sure about it. Um, now, this is, I think, where ethics comes again. Um, I personally would not want to put out a blog post that said, I guarantee that hydroxychloroquine is not going to hurt your liver or your kidney. So go ahead and take it and it will cure you of COVID-19. I think that's ethically irresponsible. But if I did it, I'm probably going to be okay, as long as I don't tell specific people to do it or, or actually give it to people to take like my kids. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, free speech, again, very broad rules. Um, I'm going to skip over this little thing other than to say that the government at certain times has actually contemplated putting innovation as a factor in the cost benefit analysis of government regulation. So essentially, um, various presidents have carried forward a rule that specifically says when you're measuring costs and benefits of government decisions and government rules, you should take into account the effect on innovation. So if the regulation is too strict and it harms innovation, innovation should sort of reweight the scales against that regulation. That's how I interpret it, at least. <coughs> in practice, I don't think they do it the way they should, but it's there in the law, and innovation should weigh more in the scales. Um, intellectual property, <coughs> pardon me, intellectual property, um, patents and copyrights are two ways that people will often try and encumber innovations and prevent other people from appropriating the benefits of them. And um, I think Eric is, is probably has a much stronger view against them than I do. But I will recognize at least that you have to be very careful with intellectual property. Too much intellectual property can strangle innovation, ironically. So the argument that more and more and more IP gives you more and more innovation, I think is empirically very questionable. And I think that you should have a light touch as you apply intellectual property. And I think that the default ought to be open, free, collaborative, 
and not locked down with patents and copyrights. Right, and full praise to Andrew, that's what he's pulling off in the Broad, which is a very <coughs> important institution. So great praise, Andrew. Well, and we, we certainly apply for patents at the Broad and that's, you know, I'm, I'm in charge of that department and that's my, that's, that's my um, you know, responsibility. But, but I think that we want innovation to thrive. So to the extent that we can maximize that as our goal, not maximize patents per se, I think that's a better, a better place to aim. And if patents can help, great. And if they don't, then I think they should get out of the way. Yeah, great. Um, and again, I'm, I'm not going to belabor this because I think you probably know enough about intellectual property. But one thing that I will note about the Constitution is that it gives the right to Congress to promote pro uh, the right to Congress to promote progress. And, and it doesn't say that Congress has the right to pass patent laws and copyright laws if that harms progress. The way that I interpret progress is more innovation. So to the extent that the patent system or the copyright system is a drag on innovation, I don't think Congress is justified to pass such laws. And I think the Constitution says that because it's to promote progress. Um, I'll give a, a quick sort of case study. Have you guys done Night Scout at all, Eric? Uh, I think early on I mentioned the uh, the artificial pancreas and uh, okay. Dana Lewis and so forth, yes. Okay, but well, yeah. this provides a nice sort of synthesis of the ideas we've been talking about. Um, Night Scout is this organization, a very loose organization of people who have loved ones or are themselves afflicted with type one diabetes. In type one diabetes, you have to be very careful to balance certain things. Your blood glucose, your insulin have to be very carefully balanced. And the consequence of not balancing is that you can go into coma and die. So it's very serious condition. Um, a lot of people have been trying to figure out the best way to treat type one diabetes. The FDA has been working on drug after drug and device after device. There's a lot of companies that sell things that are useful for type one diabetes, but there, there were a lot of people who were frustrated by the official channels and the contributions that they were making. And this group Night Scout decided that they would start to share innovations and start to innovate on themselves. And as a consequence, um, they attracted a lot of legal attention. And so let's sort of apply some of what we talked about to this case. So type one diabetes, you've got to balance things. The challenge of managing blood glucose levels is tough at the best of times, but um, when you've got type one diabetes, it's, it's especially dangerous. So one thing to do is to continuously monitor the level of glucose in your blood. And there's a variety of different ways companies have done this. Um, one of them involves a little implantable electrode and Eric and I and, a and, and Harry and a bunch of people, we got to tour the company Dexcom that makes this little implantable electrode that measures the, the glucose. Um, so you can regulate your levels by ingesting food at the right time or injecting insulin at other times. And you basically want to keep your blood glucose levels between certain high and low limits. It's a challenge. Um, one of the big challenges was some of the people in this Night Scoop, Scout group had kids. And uh, as I can attest to, kids are not the right people to regulate their own behavior. And, and kids just want to play. And, and they want to focus on other things than their highs and lows of blood glucose. And, and as I mentioned before, the mistakes can be terrible. The mistakes can be death. And in fact, the name Night Scout has to do with the fact that people with type one diabetes often pair up and call each other in the middle of the night to test their blood glucose to make sure that they're not heading in a direction that will lead to coma. Cause you can actually die in your sleep if your blood glucose levels go in the wrong direction. So people will call them, call each other at three o'clock in the morning and say, hey, what's your blood glucose at right now? And they'll test themselves. And if it's going the wrong direction, they'll either take insulin or they'll eat some food. So um, 
one of the things that the Night Scout people decided to do was to expand the functionality of the existing technology. So the existing technology was, see if I have a picture on the next page, yeah. Existing technology was a monitoring device about the size of an iPhone and this little implantable electrode. The electrode would send a message to the base unit and the base unit would plot your blood glucose. Well, the way that it had been regulated by the FDA was it was only licensed to pick up a signal within a short, with, within a short distance from the patient. So the base unit had to be close to the patient or it couldn't pick up the signal. And it certainly couldn't pick up the signal at a distance. So you couldn't broadcast the signal to a parent who was in a different city or a different part of the city. So this was a huge limitation because the parent, for example, who was monitoring the blood glucose of their child would have to stay really close to the child all the time. And that just was not convenient. So some Night Scout um, engineers, and, and we've had the privilege of meeting some of these folks like Lane Desborough and, and, and um, Dana, and uh, just a wonderful cast of characters who were trying to solve their own needs. They decided to take this black device pry it open and fiddle with the circuitry and allow it to broadcast its signal to Android phones at first and, and eventually iPhones as well. So that you could actually replicate the signal on this black device on your mobile device and you could broadcast that signal over, over the web. So this allowed people to monitor their kids or their loved ones blood glucose at a distance. And it freed up their kids to do things like sleepovers or play on the football team or go to school. Now, this attracted immediate attention from two parties. So one was the FDA. Oh, by the way, by the way, sorry, crucial piece of information. They didn't just hack this. They also spread the information everywhere they could. They started a Facebook page. They tweeted out details. They put up websites and they said, hey, we figured out how to change this device. So here's how to do it. Get a screwdriver and do the following things. And you too can broadcast your signal to your Android phone. They did this without permission. They didn't ask the company and they didn't ask the FDA. So the company started getting concerned and actually talked to Eric and me. Um, and, and said, you know, what should we do? I mean, these people, they're making our devices better. <laughs> what should we do? We're, we're worried. Well, immediately, yes, they're improving our devices. Oh my yeah, God. How dare they? They haven't asked permission. And, and what will the FDA think? And the FDA also got very interested. And the FDA at first decided that um, this really needed to be shut down. This was exactly the kind of reckless innovation that could cost <laughs> people their lives. So, the FDA contacted the company Dexcom and they said, shut this down. You've got to lock down your devices so that nobody can hack them. You've got to make an unhackable device. Well, Dexcom thought about this and they looked into it. And I think that they probably decided that they just couldn't lock it down because how do you lock a device down? How do you prevent people from hacking? I mean, it's really, really difficult to anticipate every single hack that somebody could possibly apply to your device. So they, they actually had a conversation with Eric and with me. And one of, the, one, of the converse, one of the parts of the conversation that I found most interesting was they said, you know, we're really worried about this. What should we do? And a question I asked them was, well, look, would you rather that they hacked your device or would you rather that they hack your competitor's devices? And this engendered a little conversation around the table and they decided sort of guardedly that probably if they had to choose, it's nice that people were hacking their devices and not hacking um, Medtronic's device because that implied that their device was better, more attractive. And, you know, people might actually want their device. Mm -hmm. So they pushed back on the FDA a little bit and the FDA decided to contact Night Scout directly. And they said to Night Scout, you guys got to come to DC and you got to justify your actions. So some Night Scout people, really nice folks, they actually flew to DC on their own coin. They sat down around this gigantic table with FDA lawyers disappearing into the shadows. <laughs> along, you know, hundreds of FDA lawyers. And they said to these guys, and this is, there's actually a, a transcript on the web, but I'll, I'll sort of paraphrase. The FDA said, 
you guys can't do this. And the Night Scout people said, what, what can't we do? They said, well, you, you can't modify devices and you can't broadcast signals and, and who's in charge? <laughs> and the Night Scout people looked around and they looked at one another and they said, well, I, I don't know. Um, like I take care of the Facebook site on Mondays and Tuesdays and Betty does it on Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fred does it on Friday. And if somebody's out of town, you know, Jerry comes in and looks at it, but um, you know, do we need to have somebody in charge? And the FDA realized, I think then and there, that there was literally no one to regulate because they were giving these things away for free. They were not participating in commerce and there literally was no there there. There was nobody to sue. How do you sue a Facebook page? How do you sue a Twitter account? So they went back to Dexcom. This is what I think happened. And they said to Dexcom, look, um, we're having trouble figuring out how we're going to regulate this. This is not a company. It's, it's not somebody with deep pockets. We don't really know what to do. So could you guys incorporate these features into your device? And Dexcom said, well, duh. I mean, the plans are on the web. Of course we could. But we're not going to do it because it's going to take you jokers three or four years to give us a license. And the FDA, and I happen to know that, well, I've happened to be, to have been told this, the FDA sort of said, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, incorporate the features and we will license this faster than you can say boo. So they did. They, they took the information from Night Scout, they incorporated it into their device, they made it available on the app store and for digital devices. They turned that into the FDA and the FDA turned it around within 30 days and approved the device. Yeah. I've never heard of something be licensed so quickly. And then, so basically the FDA, they saw a parade coming and they said, stop, stop, you got to stop. The parade divided and started walking around the FDA. <laughs> so the FDA realized, wow, I guess I better grab the baton and lead the parade. So they rushed up, grabbed it, and then, you know, the FDA was in charge yeah. of the parade. And I think this is a great cautionary and optimistic example of how user innovation actually succeeds in the face of opposition from the company, opposition from the FDA, and eventually the FDA and the companies come to the right decisions and they incorporate and accept the user innovation. Andrew, can I add something here? Because Please. Andrew is a hero, you guys. Not I mean, at all. No, no, no. Wait, what you have to understand is that these things don't just magically happen. So he says it was me and him, but really he was the one that went to Dexcom and said, let's think over what your options are, right? And he helped them to come to a point which they would not have come to had he not been there. And that was to say, you know what, the world is going this way, we better, we better figure out how to deal with it. And then, so, so, you know, he's doing the same thing at the Broad. And so what you have to realize is that we all have this kind of empowerment. It's, it's, it's all, when we say somehow magically the innovation wetlands should get enhanced, well, somebody's got to do it. And so all of us, I hope, will do it in our own ways. But I mean, huge praise to, uh, to, to Andrew for you know, having the skills and the willingness to be in the right place. So now, Andrew, could I applaud you? I, I think nobody else can get unmuted. I don't know. But anyway, fabulous job. Well, huge, huge, fabulous praise, job. huge praise to Eric for being such no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. You really are the hero here, and, and I admire the hell out of the, what you've done. I, I'm I, no hero, but I appreciate it. You can tell me that anytime you want. <laughs> all right, it's a deal. Well, let me just Andrew, there's like plenty of uh, comments and celebrations of you in the chat. Um, and then Georgia also had a question. Um, hopefully, you can either punch it to later, um, sure, but yeah. she has a question related to IP that um, if you're sure. willing, I'll turn it over to you. What I would suggest is this. Um, it'll take me 30 seconds to walk through these final thoughts. 
And then I've got this handy dandy diagram, at which point I can take as many questions as you want. But we're so close to being finished. Let me just wrap up the final thoughts. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. So there's all kinds of different kinds of innovation. There's the closed paradigm, patents, copyrights, etc. There's the open paradigm. And I've given some examples of that. Um, the open paradigm is quite vulnerable to being threatened by the closed paradigm and by overregulation. But the main message, and Eric C, you've trained me so well, the main message is that the legal right to innovate is very strong. And examples like Night Scout show that it can prevail even in the face of strong opposition. And, and let me just um, point to this diagram, which I, I just, I like this diagram because there's a baby duckling in it. And so everybody thinks it's, it's great. What we have up here is we have the forces trying to constrain innovation. And down here is sort of the innovation wetlands. This is what we're trying to preserve. So there are forces pushing down and impinging on the, the innovation wetlands. And then there are various sort of defenses that we talked about down here that push back up and balance things to keep the innovation wetlands safe and thriving and, and a constant source of innovation. So I'll stop there. I'm happy to take any questions folks have. Okay, we only have seven minutes left in the class. So okay. uh, how are you gonna handle this, Jane? We, we turn it over to you. Um, sure, I mean, I, the most burning question I see is from Georgia. Um, so maybe I'll pass it over to her. Sure. sure. Yeah, thank you guys, both of you. Um, yeah, I had a question about IP and uh, patent the patent system. So recently, I read "Where Idea Where Good Ideas Come From" by Stephen Johnson, and yeah. one of the points that he made was that one of the original intentions of the patent system was to help this communication of new ideas and communicate from innovator to innovator. At the same time, the other intention was to protect the IP, um, and you know clearly we've swayed towards protecting IP and not using it as the communication tool. But I'm curious what your thoughts are and if there's a way we could get back to using it that way, or if the internet has provided a different tool to do that. So, you know, the, I, he repeats the classic argument, which is the point of patents, for example, is to ensure that information becomes freely available to everybody. Even if they can't practice it, it's to publish and make available the information. That's why patent means open. Um, I would take a slightly more cynical perspective though, which is this, patents were originally um, privileges that were given out by the sovereign, so by the king or the queen, to their favorite people um, who would have monopolies on strange things. So Sir Walter Raleigh, one of the you know, explorers of the world, he was a favorite of Queen Elizabeth and he, she gave him a patent on inspecting pubs in the city of London. Um, so, I would say that the beginnings of patents were not really very salutary. Later they were adapted and the policy behind them is certainly to try and encourage innovation and balance that by giving the information as feedstock to the world. But you have to be very careful with the balance between too much protection and too little, too little access and disclosure. That, that probably sounds very bloodless, Eric, but. <laughs> um, I, I think that his idea, Stephen Johnson's portrayal of it, is is maybe a little idealized. Yeah. Other questions? Thank you. Sure. Um, Could I ask a question? Go ahead. Sure. So, like you know, um, I think uh, just trying to understand about like this hydrochloroquine, like which is a malaria drug. You know, it was already approved by FDA. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure it's already patented by whatever, maybe it's a generic, I don't know. But uh, now that it's going to be used to treat uh, COVID, right? It's, that's why Trump got a huge delivery. So um, when you want to use something that's existing for a different system of use, like instead of, you know, malaria, it's now COVID, um, how easy is it to overcome regulations? Like, I think this time because of Trump's or executive order, FDA had to probably approve it for this use. Like, uh, yeah, so, so actually, you know, you, you have a big expert in your class right now. Harry knows all kinds of things about off-label um, off use. 
there, there's an existing mechanism whereby if a doctor says it's okay, you can take any approved drug and you can give it to a patient for an indication that's not approved. Um, medical malpractice is an issue, but generally speaking, there's a lot of flexibility in the medical system to get people drugs, even if those drugs have not been approved for a particular um, disease. Um, Harry is nodding. That's a good thing. Okay. Okay. That's good. Um, I would say generally do not take medical advice from Mr. Trump. Um, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave it there. Um, but, but one thing that introduce, that there's a huge amount of flexibility that, that has been carved out of the FDA over the last four weeks because of this emergency. So the FDA is scrambling to keep up, but they are being told from, from the executive that they need to be more flexible and make more things available more quickly, whether it's antibody tests or DNA um, COVID tests or hydro, um, hydroxychloroquine or um, um, the drugs that Gilead is working on. So the FDA, I mean, this is one of the interesting things. We will know in a couple of months, we'll know all kinds of new things about the FDA because they are being forced to be more flexible because of the crisis. All these things they said they could never do, they now have to do because they're being told to do them. And that'll become part of the normal toolkit of the FDA. They'll never again be able to say, we can't do this because people say, well, you did do that. And this is just as serious as that. So you need to keep doing it. Yeah. Andrew, may I just interject about hydroxychloroquine? Sure. Um, there, there, uh, today or yesterday, there was a published report from the VA involving oh, about 400 uh, COVID-19 patients, uh, half of whom got uh, hydroxychloroquine and the other ones just got standard care. Uh, it, long story short, uh, hydroxychloroquine did absolutely nothing yeah. uh, for um, uh, the patients who got it. In fact, they had nearly a t doubling of their mortality rate. Oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you're right in suggesting that uh, the president should is not a physician. He should not <laughs> uh, uh, medical advice uh, and that people need to take a somewhat cautious view of the information coming out. Uh, at the moment, um, yeah. the, you know that the, the, the I, I'm just looking at, while we're listening. I'm looking at a at an email one of my friends sent me uh, about uh, uh, the mayor of Las Vegas who would like to use the Las Vegas casinos in an open trial to see whether a social distancing works. Um, <laughs> oh, there's, a, there's a clear innovation. Uh, she unfortunately did not want to be. The casinos at the time. I was perfectly willing to have the casino workers participate, but not her. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. I'll stop. Well, All let's right. hope that let's hope that infections that happen in Las Vegas stay in Las Vegas. Oh, there you <laughs> go. So, Andrew, do you have any final? It is now six o'clock. Do you have any final uh, remark? I just want to say what a wonderful job. Do uh, you have any final remarks? Well, on thank that? you. I just wanted to say thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to the class. This is really fun. Great questions, okay. and I'm, I'm happy to answer other questions offline if folks would like. Thanks. It's a great class. I agree. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Okay. Bye, everybody. See you uh, on Monday. Thank you. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Thank you all. It was fantastic. It was really fun. Yeah. Great. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>